Hi everyone, it's Alison. I'm in my violin studio and today I'm talking about uh, the Minuet by Baccarini at the back of the uh, Suzuki Violin School Volume 2. Um, so Baccarini was uh, an Italian composer who um, would be would have been a little older than Mozart so he was um, he went to Spain and he worked in a royal court for quite a while and then uh, his royal patrons started to die off and uh, I think he ended a little bit badly but um, so most of his music was written as, it was chamber music to be played um, probably while the you know the royal family was dining or uh, when they had friends over to play cards that kind of thing um, the minuet's really famous. The minuet comes from uh, a string quintet he wrote, and um, that would be a string quartet plus one. I, I think I'm not sure if it was a bass or what. Anyway, so let's do it. Articulation is really important in this. Um, it's not a fir fiercely difficult piece, but um, if you play, if you let it get sloppy, it just kind of is not really charming. And you know, this is all about charm, this piece. So start on your up bow. The intonation in that first four notes is usually a little tricky. You want the second finger to be snug up underneath the third, but then you have to have a nice wide whole tone to the four. Okay, now we have a long line of articulations. Gotta bite the string. I, I actually kind of do the bite on the new string. Um, not sure if I recommend that, but you can try it. But if you do the bite on the old string, and then over, and, and try, you'll see what I mean. So, bite, play, bite, bite, bite. <laughs> Is there anywhere you don't? There, we had two in a row. Up, down. Up, down. And then I bit. I mean bite, like bite into the string a little bit. So. That's a lot of articulations, and you need them all. Um, I have in my edition 04. It's a little bit tricky because you're putting your fourth finger in a lowered position. If you go up and then place your fourth finger snug to the regular three, which is to say it's in the play. Normally a D sharp, you'd put your third finger up there, but. Um, that would be more logical if you were in an orchestra, you would play four, three, because you'd want to avoid the open E string. But this is a solo, and um, it kind of has a nice ring to it. And it's a good practice for placing your, because you have to be really careful about where you place your fourth. So as you're doing it, like you can't just say, I'm going to send my fourth and it will, you know, arrive in the right place. It won't. <laughs> you have to be supervising. Okay, so I'm sending my fourth, but I'm thinking about, I'm swinging over and it should normally be aiming here, but I'm pulling back a little as, as I send it in. So... I'm, I'm feeling exactly what it feels like, and I got it. So if you're a little bit careless, you're gonna get, end up in the wrong spot. So swing your swing your arm around, and and kind of come in for the drop of the fourth finger. But as you come in to drop it, just pull it, drop it to a slightly lower spot. Okay, and then piano. And then back to mezzo forte. Okay, so, bite, bite, trill. Um, the trill, uh, the important thing with trills is 
I mean, you, you start them where they're marked, but you have to decide where you're going to end the trill. On a long note, the trill may not last for the full value of the note. I could decide to stop my trill halfway in the duration. Um, I think in this case, probably just trill right up to the turn. E, F, right? Or Mi, Fa. Now, I'm doing, because they've marked an open E string and a first finger on D, and I don't want to do, because <laughs> it wouldn't be really lovely. Um, I'm doing a little bit of a lift in the middle of my stroke, because I want to lift my bow up and over the A string. I don't want to hear that. It's not really up into the air. It's not that, but it's just, I just kind of barely stop the bow from moving while I'm going over the A. Right? Because <laughs> it needs to be a secret. Okay. If you were to do a 4-1, a you don't need to do that. But it's just it's hard to make a fourth finger sound as nice. And it depends. Um, in an orchestra concept, you don't want to play open E's ever. Um, sometimes in solo playing, it depends, you know, sometimes it works. Uh, going on. So we've got a mezzo forte diminuendo. And there's another diminuendo here. I think probably what this really means, sometimes a diminuendo specifically means you you are a certain degree of loudness and now we're coming to less. Sometimes, every once in a while, it just kind of means bring up that first note where the diminuendo started. So... piano, right? And um, when you have the natural on the C, because in, in the key signature, it's an A major key signature, right? There's a, um, a C sharp. But we've got a C natural on this note. And remember that a natural, an alteration of any sort, remains in effect up to the next bar line. Uh, in actual fact, we don't run into another C until a later bar. So, bite, 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 bite. Now we're in piano, so quiet. Bite, bite. So those are not aggressive bites, though. They're just light. They're just, you know, can you see my hand? Just a little bit of a boop, boop, a little bit of a pinch. Good. Going on. There's that funny diminuendo again. We already were quiet, but now it put mezzo forte. So the first note is a little bit louder than what we were doing before, because we were only piano before. Now this is mezzo piano, which a half piano <laughs> takes it back towards forte, right? It doesn't make it quieter. It makes it, so a mezzo piano is louder than a piano. So this first note <laughs> is louder, and then we kind of, and now we have now, the first note has a dot, an articulation dot on it. Second note has an accent. Third note has an accent. Um, there's a subtext in this, um, and I don't want to get into arguments with people. <laughs> um, but composers of that period assumed that you would be putting a little bit of stress on the major beats. And it's something we've kind of lost over the, the centuries, because in 20th century music, we all learned how to make all beats absolutely even because in a lot of 20th century music that was important. But if you go back to the older music, it was expected that there would be a stress. And this is in three, so your normal stress pattern would be one, two, three. So your first beat's important, second beat is kind of important, third beat, you can almost throw it away. You know, and, and then when you play your music with that feeling, and that will never be indicated in the part, but when you play the music with that feeling, people know how to dance to it, and, and it has a groove, you know? If you play one, two, three, one, two, three, it, it's just, it's not much fun, right? But it's a one, two, three, one, two. So there's an assumed stress on the first beat, um, which is also a very short note because of the dot. So just kind of bite it and get out of the way. And now you've got an accent here, which means this one should be just as much. And another accent here. So again, just as much. 
And that's, of course, a syncopated rhythm. I can't do that in play, but you see what I mean. Same thing in this bar. Okay, so those are the same. Um, this is actually the same as the first line. I didn't talk about the accents when we were doing the first line. And this time I'm not going to talk about the articulations because I did before. Um. Same thing here. Kind of take it easy going over that open string. Don't want to hit it. Um, and then you take your repeat. I'm going to go on. So the trio. Trios typically are kind of... Uh, less serious in a compositional terms. It might just kind of like be an idea. It's kind of cute. It's fun. Um, there's often French horns involved, <laughs> except not when it's a string quintet. Okay, so it's just kind of a thing. And of course, what we have in this part is not really terribly interesting, and that's because the other instruments are carrying probably the more interesting stuff. So... So, small bows, these are these kind of little pinch um, articulations. And we've got a crescendo. Um, when we have um, a crash de double, uh, eighth note followed by two sixteenths. We always, almost always, stop the bow after the eighth note. And then you have your two sixteenths and the eighth stop. Two sixteenths and eighth. Okay, so you have three notes together which are legato and you have articulations between them. Stop. 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 articulations and basically these crescendo and diminuendo lines if you notice they're just following when the line goes up you get louder and when the line goes down it gets quieter so uh, it's not really something you have to worry about a whole lot it will probably happen fairly naturally going on um, this this goes up to a mezzo forte so you know again a good stress on the first one, repeat on the second. Okay. And you need to articulate between them, otherwise it doesn't make sense musically. You can't do because um, from five feet away you can't tell that there was four notes. It just sounds like one. So bite, bite, bite. on these two notes, I mean articulation dots, and not here. But you're not going to suddenly apply that legato, it would be weird. So going on, this is we're very much an accompanying figure here. Um, three, one. I recommend strongly that you have your bow placed on the string on one. And so if I'm up in the air, three, one, and one, and one. That's if you're moving your bow. But you can't really leave your bow on the string because you're going to, you've got down, up, down. So you kind of work your, you keep working your way to the tip and you're going to get stuck. So you have to replace, I think. And back. And back. Uh, yeah. And then second time, pianissimo. Okay, and going on after that, then you just come back to piano, which is uh, the difference, I think, personally for myself. When I see a piano, I want it to be a soft sound. 
it's still the the sound still has a bit of body to it. Um, when I say a pianissimo, I think of that as being more of a veil of of sound. It 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 does. It's like a it's like Casper Casper the ghost in the movies. Um, you should be able to kind of hear through it. You know, pianissimo as opposed to. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that difference with, you know, cameras and computers and all that. But, so, when it's pianissimo, you can go for something really kind of transparent. Piano has a little more body. Mezzo piano is, yeah, you know. The sound has, well, that's maybe too much. But the important point is make a difference between these levels of, of dynamic, right? So that the listener will have some variety you know it's like oh that kind of a sound oh that kind of a sound because that's where your interest comes from so at the end of this mezzo forte again the stop and you've got the E string and then over to four on A right that's a bit tricky you tend to get a, a flare in it so Here's a forte, a full forte. Okay. I forget when you're going to G string. Arm nice and high. And uh, that's about it. The, the tempo indication is um, moderato e grazioso. Um, so graciously and moderate. <laughs> Um, but it's a minuet, so you have to play that at a tempo that a person wearing a really big wig um, and and uh, shoes made out of horse glue, <laughs> a tempo that they can delicately dance at without damaging their outfit. Okay, that's the, that's the rule. So have fun. Good luck.